<laughs> okay, so I have your critical thinkings from last time on the two questions were what is justice and what does justice have to do with marketing and so we talked a little bit about those. And I saw some interesting patterns and things like that, some interesting ideas that I think you'll see will emerge from the various philosophies that we'll talk about in this class. And so obviously what we need to do is we need to combine, I guess I'm going to shut my door because uh, I talk loud. I have had, I've had professors come and slam my door because they think I talk too loud. So we're going to combine marketing philosophy with ethics in this. So we're going to have the intersection of two. So I have, I posted your grades online. I made a little, few little comments here and there. Vicious and delicious. If you want, if you need help reading my writing, type A. Interfactual. The Fantastic Four. And then the Zellers. There you go. So I posted those grades to you too. So be sure and check and look at those. So let's talk a little bit since I asked the question how does justice relate to marketing? I think what we need to do is we need to understand, first of all, what the domain of marketing is. And so we can talk about those marketing theories and how those are going to drive our analysis with the combination of philosophical ethics in this class. So let's start with what is marketing? Somebody want to give me a definition of what is marketing? Meeting consumers' needs. Okay. Exchange activities. So what we've got is we've got consumers' needs. Value proposition. Marketing. Consumers' needs. Exchange. Creating and keeping customers. Okay. Uh, creating. And keeping customers. What did you say? Relationships. <laughs> what? It is the fully integrated <laughs> function of the firm. Marketing is the fully integrated function of the firm. What else? Somebody said. Somebody said the four P's, didn't they? Who said that? Value proposition. Value proposition. Somebody say the four P's? I thought I heard that. I'll take credit for it. You'll take credit for it? Okay. What else? Any other ideas about what is marketing? How many of you are marketing majors? How many of you are marketing minors? How many of you are professional sales majors? Okay. All right. Any professional sales minors? Any non business minor in here, or major? Okay. So for those of you who are marketing majors, what else can you put to this list of what is marketing? Well, let's think about this for a minute. Is marketing an art or a science? It's an art. <coughs> A little bit of both. Both? It incorporates both aspects from both genres. Okay. And, and how does it incorporate both? Uh, the marketing, the art one seems pretty obvious. But then with like the science one, you need the data, you need to do the research to be able to interpret and find the target market and find ways to maybe um, help market and promote to appeal to their needs. Okay. So we can use data to predict outcomes, so that's science. I asked you, I think at one point when we started talking about logic and critical thinking, is everything on a college, could I ask you this, is everything on a college campus either an art or a science? Okay. And I said there may be a third category and it's pure logic. Marketing is, is 
clearly an art in some respects, the design of advertisements for aesthetics is artistic, but there is a science we can study people and their behaviors in ever increasingly scientific ways. And one of the ways that we can do that is through <coughs> things like fMRI technology, where we actually monitor and look at people's brain activities when certain things are occurring. Certain marketing pitches are being made, and so that's clearly <coughs> science. So marketing is both an art and a science. Do we talk about the definition of marketing in here? Mm -hmm. No. So since it's a science, one of the things that we have to do is we have to determine what is the domain of the science. What is it that we're going to study? What makes it different from other sciences? And I think, to some extent, that's really easy with some of the older sciences on a college campus that have very clearly defined domains. And it is less easy with sciences that are more contemporary or modern in their origins and are still, in some respects, struggling to find where they are. Now, the really interesting thing about that is that for those of you who want to go on and get a PhD in marketing, and it is a nice lifestyle, that's good for you that we're sort of at the dawn of our discipline still because there is still an opportunity, if you're interested in being a marketing scholar, for making contributions to theory in major ways that you may not have in something like physics where a lot of this is understood and you're working around the margins. Although I guess there are big breakthroughs in physics as well, but biology and things like that. So if I ask you, for example, what the domain, we've got these ideas of marketing. If I said, what's the domain of biology, what would you say? What is the domain of biology? It is the study of living organisms. That's what makes it biology. It's studying, we're not going to study, biologists don't study what? They don't study rocks. Maybe they do because there may be fossil remains in the rocks. And so, but you know, I mean, there are clearly things that are not living that are not part of biology. When we're talking about physics, what we're talking about is the domain of what? What is physics? Physicists will tell you that physics is the mother science, that all other sciences are. They would be wrong. You should be able to explain the world from the perspective of your discipline. So physics deals with motion and physical properties, the way things move, objects, space, things like that. So astrophysics deals with the study of what? Yeah, why, why, I, I, is that at all interesting? Why should we? They're learning all kinds of new things. Stephen Hawking has rethought some of his earlier theories we're learning all kinds of interesting things about black holes. And, but should we really worry about that kind of thing? I don't know. Maybe we could see a, a practical implication in that what happens in space might have an impact on the Earth. What is the most current accepted theory as to what probably happened to the dinosaurs? That what? An asteroid. Hit, hit the earth and caused a major change in climatological conditions that was not conducive to the sustaining of that life. I and mean, that's the most recent thing. Has anybody heard anything else that's more recent than that? That seems to be the accepted sort of theory. How many of you went and saw Jurassic World when it was released? Do you like it better than the original? No? I don't know. I like it, but nothing's better than the original. Nothing's better than the original. It's better than the sequels, but it's not yeah. better than yeah. the original. Okay, all right. I thought it was good. You know, then here they've got um, recreating life that's 
gone, and so again, maybe biology would, would help us with studying rocks and fossils to get the DNA that we need. But those are clearly defined realms. Marketing, because it's a neurodiscipline, is less clearly defined, and so the definition of marketing has changed. And we didn't talk about the original definition of marketing in here. Yes or no? no. Okay. So the first definition of marketing was established by the American Marketing Teachers Association, which was the precursor to what we call the AMA today, the American Marketing Association. And for those of you who are interested, we are, you can join AMA. I encourage you to join AMA. It's cheap while you're a student. We're going to go to nationals again this year, which the conference is always in New Orleans, and that's kind of fun. And you can go if you want to compete. I think I may have one slot still open. The school pays for you to go. How many of you are juniors in here? Okay, you should consider joining AMA, getting involved. We're, we've got a whole bunch of people that are seniors that are about to graduate that are going to be leaving leadership positions, and that's an opportunity to get the school to pay for a trip. The sales team is the other way to get the school to pay for travel. But the uh, precursor to the AMA was the uh, Marketing Teachers Association, the National Marketing Teachers Association. And their original definition was promulgated in 1935. That will tell you how new the discipline really is. I mean, if you talk about biology, we've had an idea of what biology is for, for millennia now. And we didn't get a definition of marketing until 1935. And that definition says that marketing is the performance of business activities. Marketing, and for those of you who have had me before, this should not be new to you, and so I apologize for the redundancy, but repetition is good in terms of stressing things that you should know. And the reason you should know this definition is because I don't think it's a very good definition. And that's important because we're going to have to come up with a better definition. So marketing is the performance of business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumers. So in 1935, we said that marketing is the performance of the business activities that direct the flow of goods and services from producer to consumers. Now, since I said that's not a good definition, Again, understanding where we've come from is important. And what's wrong with that definition of marketing? For those of you who wrote it down, what's wrong with that definition of marketing? Pretty vague. It's what? Vague. Do you think it's vague? Do uh, <coughs> you think it's what? Oh, maybe it's just too narrow and it's all vague. Ah, uh, I think that's it. I don't think it's too vague. I think it's too narrow. I think it's a very specific definition. It looks at the specific business processes that are involved from getting goods and services from producer to consumer, and is that all of marketing? Now, that's what we might call today what? Logistics. It's, that, it's really is the focus of logistics, and so why would that be the definition that they came up with in 1935? What, what's What's going on? Where did marketing originate in terms of the history of sort of marketing thought? Where did marketing originate? What kinds of schools did marketing originate from? Okay, what are the foundational disciplines of marketing? For those of you who have had me, you should know this. There are two foundational disciplines of marketing. I make merciless fun of both of those disciplines in my classes. So what would you say are the foundational disciplines of marketing? Any guesses? Mm -hmm. 
Well, what's one of the major courses historically in the marketing department? Consumer behavior. Consumer behavior is a huge field in marketing. And what you find is you find lots of schools that focus on CV. So what would be one of the foundational disciplines? Psychology. Psychology is one of two foundational disciplines of marketing. I think that psychology is the closest thing to witchcraft that I teach <coughs> on a college campus. You lay down on the couch, tell me your problems, and I'll interpret your dreams. Spacey. In the words of one of the characters on Pulp Fiction, ooh, that's trippy. That's sort of psychology. Let me interpret your latent you know, tendencies. So what, what do you think the other one is? So if you got psychology, what's the other one? The other one is economics, and agricultural economics in particular. So what we see is in 1935, a concern with, and this definition is reflective of that concern, what we see is this concern with getting goods from producer to consumer, and so a lot of the earliest marketing studies were logistics studies, were transportation studies, and why would that be a concern in 1935? Why would we really be focused on this ability of getting goods and services from producer to consumer in 1935, and that would, that would frame the debate for what was going to be marketing for the next few generations, or few, for a few decades in the discipline. Why do you think that was a problem in 1935? What? Okay, but what else is happening? So one of the things that I am currently reading, so I'm always reading a book, and one of the ones that I'm reading now is called Audacious Brew, and it's the history of beer in the United States. And so she, it's a, by a historian, and the study that she undertakes is this look back because she says, you know, if you go to a, a bar and you start talking, and particularly now, one of the things that's happened is that we've seen this increase in microbreweries popping up and all of these sort of specialty pubs going back. And what people will tell you when you go into them is that at one point in time in the American experience, the brewing of beer was a local thing, and there were all of these wonderful beers that citizens and, and, and consumers had. And then the big giants came in and swallowed it up and basically made you know, this watered-down beer that has no flavor and no body or, or, or real uh, distinguishing characteristics. And now we're getting back to that <laughs> purer form. And so this historian that's writing this undertakes to sort of see if the mythology is true. And if you go to these beer bars, you can probably find that is kind of an attitude and sort of this myth of what's happened. So, for example, there's one here in Edmond that's popped up. It's got all these beers on tap, and what's the name of it? Anybody been there? The Patriarch. The Patriarch. And it's what? Craft Brew. It's Craft Brew, and it's in an old house in downtown Edmond. And they've got, I don't know, something like 60 or something odd beers on tap. And they're all, their big thing is from local, local producers. And you can go and, and try different beers. And they'll give you this mythology that she talks about in there about how this is a, a better beer. And it turns out that that really wasn't so. Beer was pretty disgusting in the early parts. And most people didn't drink it. It was not really the wonderful product that we think that it might have been with these sort of um, you know, small microbreweries. But the reason that there were these small microbreweries is that in order to brew beer, and one of the things that you have to have is you have to have the, the right temperature conditions. And at the beginning, in the founding of our nation, that could be problematic in terms of getting the temperature to drop from once you start boiling the mash and distilling it to the appropriate temperature because they didn't have what in those early periods? Refrigerators. How did you get refrigeration? You didn't have it. What did they do? They got blocks of ice. They, they stored ice from winter and things like that and kept it in ice houses. 
and that's how you, you got it. And so, and so these first brewers, in order to get the temperature right, one of the things that they did where they stored it before pasteurization was they stored it in actual underground. So they had these beer caves are a takeoff on this. They stored their lagers in these underground caverns in order to keep the temperature right because if the temperature got too hot, what would happen to the beer before pasteurization? It would go bad. It would be sort of disgusting. And so it's really um, past Blue Ribbon and Anheuser-Busch to come <coughs> to the fold and really bring in this lighter lager that everybody liked. And um, Budweiser is a traditionally German beer. And so those were sort of the two that emerged and became big. But what allowed them to get big was this ability to transport their product beyond just the local market. Once we started getting things, and I can't remember which one was the first one to actually get refrigerated rail cars to buy refrigeration and design. I think it was actually Anheuser-Busch that came up with the first rail car so that they could ship their product to Texas. That was the first big place that they expanded the market, was to ship it to Texas. And so you had to keep it cool. And this early definition, I think, focuses on that was really a problem in the early days of marketing. And in 1935, the way things spoiled was incredibly you know, different because we had much more crude refrigeration and so there was this emphasis on getting products from farm to market efficiently and I think that's what's inherent in this definition. So you see marketing emerging from, the disciplines of marketing emerging from those agricultural economic schools that are very concerned about how it is that you get your product from farm to market in, in a way and keep it from spoiling. One of the big schools that marketing emerges in is the University of Wisconsin. What do they produce voluminous amounts of in Wisconsin? Cheese. So you get these kind of cheese studies, logistic studies on how you do that. You actually get marketing scholars to get on trains and follow this stuff through. There's a modern day version of this kind of marketing study that's undertaken by a journalist named Rose George. And what she does is she looks at shipping. And her book is called 90% of everything. 90% of everything. And she does kind of what is an old fashioned kind of study in that she starts by asking people what percentage of stuff do you think is shipped to you or comes to you on uh, shipping? And most people say, not much. What would you guess? How much of your stuff is brought to you by shipping? 5%. You'd say 5%? The answer is 90%. 90% of everything is shipped. Now, Apple actually doesn't engage in shipping, but lots of cell phone companies do. What does it cost to ship a device this size across the ocean? So one of the things that makes it efficient and economic to ship a product and have it manufactured in communist China and come to the United States is the cost. So lots of companies ship devices like this. They ship them on container ships. What do you think it costs to ship from China to a port in the United States <clears throat> this size of device? How much does this device cost? What's an Apple i6 cost? When I bought this, I think it was $800. Now, you, they've changed the pricing models on these. And of course, you can get an iPhone 5 for a lot less because the minute the new model comes out. And so I'm not sure that this is worth that much because what's happened? What has Apple released? The what? The 6S. How many of you have got a 6S? Why did you run out and buy a 6S? Because I broke my phone. So, you know, so you broke your phone and you thought you'd get the newer model rather than going with the 6. So you got the 6S. Is there a lot of difference between the 6 and the 6S? It's massive. Massive di differences? Or? No, it's, it's big. You could get that in the iPhone 6 Plus, couldn't you? Yeah. All right. So 
What do you think it costs to ship a device? For example, a, a droid phone from China to the United States. So this costs 800 bucks, somewhere in there. What do you think the cost of shipping it is? Three or four dollars? Who says by more? The, by the way, more. How much? Wasn't it like three cents? Three cents. Three cents to ship to ship something like this. So she actually does this. She goes on um, the uh, Maersk Kindle and goes through the pirate waters and you know sees how shipping is done. This anonymous thing that we don't see that you used to um, see a lot of, but anymore because the number of people involved in it has decreased. It used to be that a lot of people, particularly if you lived on the coast, were involved in shipping. Now, even if you live near the coast, you're probably not involved in shipping. And one of the reasons why it costs three cents to ship and why don't we have Americans that are flocking to the sea to be shippers anymore? Because they don't pay worth anything. Who do they get to be the labor on the ship. First of all, there's not as many need for as much labor. How do they put stuff and load stuff on container ships? Now, it used to be in the olden days, what would they do? You'd have to actually have manual labor lifting this stuff on. Container ships are wonderful because what? They have these standard sized units that stack, and so how do they put them on the container ship? By crane. So the number of people that it costs, or the number of people that it takes to run a ship anymore is much less. And what may happen in the future is with particularly global positioning systems and the ability to have autopilot, you may not even have anybody on the ships in the future. If we may get self-driving ships before we get self-driving because it's much easier to do that, to actually maneuver a ship, than it is to deal with all of the traffic that we have on the road. So we may see <coughs> self-driving ships, and if you can do that, you would only have to have people at the ports to basically offload the container ships and you wouldn't even have these huge crews that are required. And the crews are de minimis compared to what they used to be in the past. And so this is sort of that kind of study that she does. And so it's this focus on how do we get this stuff from the producer. If we can produce it, then how do we keep it and get it to the consumer efficiently? And that's what you see in this early definition. This next definition you don't need to know. Um, by the mid-1980s, the first revisions were made to the definition, so we went with that definition until 1980s, and the new definition that they came out with, the AMA came out with in the 80s, is marketing, and again, you don't have to know this one, marketing is the process of planning and executing the conception, pricing, promotion, and distribution of ideas, goods, and services to create exchanges that satisfy individuals and organizational objectives. Now, I think this is much more complete definition and that it focuses on we're not just going to market products and services from producer to consumer we're also going to market ideas and we see that in the modern age with political marketing which is one of the courses that I teach here from time to time and we're going to offer it I think in the fall if you're interested in political marketing and what is it that we're offering in the political marketplace what is it that Donald Trump is attempting to do he's trying to sell his what his ideas on, and what's his big idea? Well, that, that, that's a sub-idea of his grander vision. And so what we need to think about is we've got to think about an overarching vision. What's his overarching philosophy that we're going to do for make America, make America great again? We're going to make America great again. And so I guess the idea is that A, we're not great anymore, <laughs> that we were great at one time, but that we've lost it. Is that true? Have we have we lost our greatness? Who's the world's largest economy? Who's the world's largest economy? China? No. The United States. It's still the world's who's the world's largest superpower? Was, now, in terms of military, China actually does have more people in boots than we do. But, you know, who's more powerful? They have nuclear weapons, I guess, if they could float them over here on a ship. They don't have a terribly effective delivery systems. Who's the world's superpower in terms of military? We are. So are we, have we lost our greatness? Do we need to regain it? 
I don't know. So that's the idea that, uh, that Donald Trump is selling. What's the idea that Bernie Sanders is selling? Build the burn. That's a slogan, not an idea. That's a, a hashtag, maybe, a marketing pitch. What's Bernie Sanders' idea? We're going to sum up his ideas. Maybe it's a Robin Hood. Doesn't he always say that revolution? Revolution? Uh, it's the idea that we're going to have a massive redistribution of wealth from rich to poor because we've got all these people that are working. We've got this huge economy, we've got the largest economy in the world, and yet we have this widening gap in this economy where the wealth that's being created is not being shared by a lot of people. And so his idea is that we're going to start sharing the wealth. We're going to have democratic-style socialism that they have in places like Western Europe. And that's his idea. So it's th this new definition that we get in the 1980s, I think, recognizes that. And it recognizes that it's not just business activities, but that it's individuals and organizations. And I think that's important, because we all engage in marketing ourselves. And it's not just businesses that market. It's nonprofits that market as well. And it's not just nonprofits and businesses. It's also, what, governmental entities that market. We are going through an entire rebranding campaign here at UCO, and why are we doing that? Why is it that we want to market our institution? We're a government institution. Why do we want to market that? More students. More students. What? More people in the seats. Get more people in the seats. Compete with those for-profit institutions like the University of Phoenix, although it's not hard to compete with them anymore because most people have realized that they're way too expensive for what you get. But we do have to compete in, a, in an environment in which there are fewer of you than there maybe once were, and why is that? Are people having the number of children that they used to have? No. The number of children is decreasing, why? costs a lot of money to have kids. One of my friends has four. When I was growing up, there were lots of families I knew that had four and five and six kids. Now, among your generation, a lot of you are choosing to have how many kids? One, two, three. Zero. That was my choice, was zero. But a lot, of, a lot of couples are choosing to have one. And it was even in the past, and that's okay. A lot of them are saying, yeah, that's fine. In the past, it was, well, if you have one, you might, you, you ought to have two so that you, you're not an only child. You need a match set. But a lot of people are saying, no, I'm stopping with one. Although Communist China has finally, the only good idea Communist China ever had was its one child policy, and they've now lifted that. They've decided that they're going to lift that policy and allow people to have more than one child. So, uh, we're going to have to market our institution because the age of the population that is going to college is going to get smaller as the population gets older and there's the graying of America. And this could be very problematic for our country in terms of supporting social entitlement programs like Social Security. And a lot of Students tell me that they're very concerned about whether or not Social Security, and they don't believe that Social Security will, will be there when they retire. What do you all think? Do you think it'll be there? I think it will absolutely be there, and I'll tell you why. Because the AARP does a very good job of marketing, and they do a very good job of unelecting politicians who say things like they're going to change Social Security. Ronald Reagan in the 1980s suggested that people like my grandmother didn't need to have the benefits that she had. She had three retirements that she got plus Social Security. So she had a husband who had a retirement and he died. And so she got his retirement. She worked all of her life for the Sandy Corporation and she got her retirement. And then she had a third husband, or she had a second husband, I'm sorry, who also had a retirement, a pension, a defined benefit plan. And he died and she got that and she was getting Social Security. She didn't need Social Security in any way, shape, or form. But Ronald Reagan threatened to cut benefits for people like her 
because they didn't need it and have a means testing for Social Security. She was a lifelong Republican. My grandfather's uncle was a governor of the great state of Kentucky as a Republican. And she went down the next day and changed her voter <coughs> registration to Democrat and never voted for another Republican ever again after Ronald Reagan suggested, didn't get it passed, suggested that someone like her didn't need Social Security. But it was hers by divine right and intervention. And by God, you, you, you want to talk about an unholy war. Suggest you're going to tamper with Social Security and you will have every Q-tip in the nation willing to march on Washington, D.C. So, you know, I think there will be Social Security because the AARP will engage in really good marketing, political marketing, and keep it there. And so there is this recognition. And we have to market as a result of the growing of America to try to attract students because we now rely more and more heavily on your tuition dollars. As we have fewer and fewer uh, opportunities because of this growing older population out there. So the current definition is that marketing is the activity, this one you should know, for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that benefit customers, organization, stakeholders, and society at large. So marketing is the activity for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging <coughs> offerings that benefit customers, organizations, stakeholders, and society at large. The AMA, does anybody need to repeat that one more time? The AMA has put out a call for people who want to contribute to changing or revising the definition of marketing. And I would add to that that I believe it should begin with the phrase, marketing is, this is a test question, marketing is a pervasive social activity. Marketing is a pervasive social activity. One of the things that makes teaching marketing a lot of fun compared to some other classes, I can't imagine what it would be like to teach, for example, in the math department and have to teach sections of math for idiots or whatever it was that I had to take when I was an undergraduate. I took just the bare minimum amount of math that I could get away with because I was not a math person. How many of you are not math people? You hate math. Like math, math scares you. How many of you think that? Math is scary. And it's, it, why is it scary? Because it's really hard. And I would hate to be one of those professors over there that teaches the general education requirements because you've got students in those classes that don't need it, don't like it, and I guess math, you need math to some extent, but the amount of math that you actually need is not on a daily basis that great. What kind of math skills do you need on a daily basis to get through life in the world? Uh, yeah, I think you need to be able to add and subtract <laughs> and figure things out. You know, we'll talk about pricing in here and some of the things. You don't even really have to know that much about percentages. I mean, you can, you can fumble your way through and sort of do the ocular method in terms of whether or not you're getting a good deal or not. I think there's a lot of deception in terms of advertising of promotions 
in terms of the percentages that we'll get off, and we'll talk about that in here when we talk about deceptive advertising and promotion. But I don't think you even have to have a whole lot of ability to divide or do percentages, really, if you're just functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're just worried about bringing in enough money to put, in the words of George W. Bush, to put food on your family. It's one of the things he said. He said, if you're a working mom, I know how difficult it is for you to put food on your family. I use that frequently when I leave here at the end of the day. I tell my department chair, I'm going home to put food on my family. <laughs> So, I don't think you have to have any higher order math, but you really can't escape marketing. It's really a lot more fun to teach than a course where people sit there and say, you know, why are you in this class? Well, because I have to have college algebra. My degree requires it, but I hate math, I have no interest in it, and I'm probably never going to use it. <coughs> and they may never use it. I'm still not certain why we make you take calculus for business. You all have had calculus for business, and that was an unpleasant experience for some of you. Now, I don't understand why you think statistics is worse, because statistics, you can see practical applications of statistics in terms of what you can do for marketing, can't you? Calculus. Okay. For me, it was, it was, statistics right. was hard. Statistics yeah. was hard? Yeah. yeah. What kinds of examples did they have in your statistics class? Uh, I mean, if you get good examples, it's really easy. I couldn't really understand what professor said. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, when I was taking my <laughs> statistics <laughs> series for the PhD program, it was taught by people in um, the stat department, which had moved around. The stat department. I went to a state school, and state schools are historically what kinds of schools? So I went to New Mexico State. What kinds of schools are state schools? How are state schools generally founded? What, what's the older term that most... A yeah, most of them started out. OSU is Oklahoma State. They started out as Oklahoma Agricultural and Mechanical College. And New Mexico State started out as New Mexico Agricultural and Mechanical College. And so they're ag schools. They're land-grant schools. And they fulfill that mission. So the stats department at New Mexico State has historically been in the agricultural school because that was the primary research college at that school at one time because that was the mission of the school was to focus on agriculture. And so all of the examples that they came up with were all of these, what is New Mexico famous for? Particularly, what, what crop were they famous for? Green chili. And it comes from a town very close to Las Cruces, which is where they grow the, and they grew the green chili that you all eat. They cultivated that at New Mexico State. That's their prize winning thing to add to the body of agricultural science. It's something called the Hatch 365, I think, or something like that. New Mexico 365. It comes out of this cultivar, and it's grown in Hatch, New Mexico. So almost all of you <coughs> green chili cans. And how many of you like green chili? You should love green chili. It goes on everything. There's nothing that can be made better than the So they grew this in New Mexico, and all of the examples that they had in statistics were about chili pod cultivars. And I thought, can you give us another example besides the chili pod, like a business example that might be useful to us? And they're like, uh, no. So I had to figure out stats on my own. But if you get good examples, I think stats you can see a practical implication for statistics in your everyday life, and so I always thought that was much more useful than business calculus, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. So, uh, we are, we're having to market ourselves, and we do this constantly whether we think about it or not, which is why it's a pervasive activity, and it's something that people genuinely enjoy. Unlike those classes like math and statistics, people actually like marketing. Why? It's kind of fun. You get to talk about things like advertising and promotion, and we'll watch ads in this class. And so it's something that we engage in and we like, and it is a pervasive social activity. We do it constantly. Even when we don't think that we're doing it, we are marketing. Everything about you is, is something that's marketing. Why are you wearing the clothes that you wear? It's marketing, isn't it? Aren't your clothes an expression of what? Yourself. What? 
Yourself. Yeah, they're expressions of yourself, aren't they? I don't see anything that's too out of the norm as I look across this classroom. Most of you are dressed pretty much like college students dress in terms of what? Jeans, sweatshirts, hoodies, polar tech type clothing to keep warm since the temperature outside is fluctuating. It's one of those things that you should do in uh, these classes here at UCS. You should come prepared, dress in layers so that you can start shedding them because some rooms, since we've been put on the central loop, are enormously hot and other rooms are frigid. And uh, so you're, you're wearing stuff, I don't see any Lady Gaga's in here. <laughs> now that's her marketing, isn't it? Is to do what, although she's gotten far less crazy in the looks than she's promoting now. I mean, she's plainly boring in her latest commercial that aired over the holidays with, with you know, who's the other singer that she's in there with? Doing the... No, it's uh, yeah. Tony Bia, yeah, doing the um, Baby It's Cold Outside for the Holidays. And she, she actually looks normal, so she's abandoned the wild clothing and has left that brand image to who? Who's the new one that's out there? Wearing? Miley Cyrus. I don't think it's Miley It's Sia, don't you think? I mean, like, that, that, that woman has got some real <laughs> trippy outfits. That she, that she sports. But Lady Gaga used to sport these sort of trippy outfits as well, and that was her marketing brand. Why is it that you all are dressed the way you're dressed, and why are you sort of fitting in with your, your well, because you want people to like you, and you want them to be friends, because you want to market yourself, you might need them, you might need help getting notes and things like that in class, and so if you look too far off the spectrum, uh, that might be difficult. For you, although there are people who you know take those risks and sort of. Do you all remember the goth movement? <laughs> that look, it was it was a tragically bad, bad look. But that's a marketing statement that they got, which is what? What are they trying to say to you? I hate everyone. Are you what? I hate everyone. I hate I hate life. <laughs> I hate everyone. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a pervasive activity that we do all the time. We constantly engage in it. And I think that's one of the things that makes marketing really a lot of fun to, to study. Now, having said that as a study, we have to develop, part of this is theory development. So what are some marketing theories? So I asked you in the second part of the question, I said, what is justice and how does it apply to marketing? So we're going to apply this concept of justice to marketing in the marketing context. So what are some marketing theories that are out there that we can apply this concept to? How many of you remember this? How many of you have, how many of you have any principles of marketing? Two years ago. Three years ago. And we've forgotten what the marketing theories are already? <laughs> We, we crammed that information into our heads long enough to regurgitate it on the first exam in the Principles of Marketing class, and then we just information dumped that right on out. Because we had to make, we had to make room in our brains for something else, like statistics. And that we had to cram in, and that was really hard, and we didn't, didn't like that. Definitely, information dumped that stuff immediately after getting through that class, the calculus class. Well, the oldest theory in marketing, and one that we've seen for most of human history, is the production philosophy of marketing. And these philosophies correspond with certain epics. For most of human history, we have seen the production philosophy. Now, I just finished telling you 
that marketing as a discipline is a new discipline. It emerges in colleges and universities at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, and we don't even get a definition of marketing promulgated until 1935. But having said that, the activity, the social activity of marketing is something that has taken place from the earliest times we find evidence of this ethos or ethos that involves the ideas and exchanges of goods and services. We even see evidence of this in the evidence of where we get our earliest society. So we don't know for certain where the first actual society emerged, but we know it was probably somewhere in the Fertile Crescent, and we have at least evidence of it in our archaeological and anthropological record, and it's recorded in certain great works um, and in our mythologies and in our, our histories. And you even find evidence of it in, for example, the Bible. So there are two sort of traditions that we can look at in terms of this emergence of a cultural and societal identity that emerged from what we might term the prehistory or what we might call the primitive psyche. So there was a time in which, in the past, we weren't really maybe as social as we are today. And we can find evidence of that in the anthropological and archaeological record that man was kind of, in many respects, maybe a very solitary or, or banded together only in small familial groups, that he was obviously suspicious of other groups. But at some point in time, we, we have this clear break and a recognition of the need to form collective, coherent societies. We find evidence of this in the Upanishads. We find evidence of it in the Greek histories and in the Greek poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And we find it in the Christian tradition in the Bible, in the story of Genesis and in the Garden of Eden, <coughs> where man eats from the tree of knowledge, appropriate name, and recognizes himself as distinct from the cosmos. And at that point, once we realize that we're distinct from the cosmos, we become social creatures, and we begin to form societies, and at that point we begin to market. Because we have to rely on each other for other things. Not everybody can produce everything that he or she needs in order to survive, which is one of the reasons that we come out of this primitive psyche and form societies is because life in those conditions was, as Hobbes put it in Leviathan, nasty, brutish, and short. It was a war of all against all. And so at that point we get marketing, and for most of this history, we could say the production philosophy from the earliest times until about the 1920s was the dominant philosophy. It can be summed up by one movie, and one line from that movie, and the movie is called A Field of Dreams, and the takeaway line from The Field of Dreams is what? If you build it, they will come. And for most of human history, what we have is we have this idea, if you build it, people will buy it. All you have to do is produce. So, I have chickens and eggs, you have a cow, I just trade some eggs for some milk, and we're, we're off to the races. Now, it's not that easy. 
even the most mundane of items are differentiated, aren't they? They're not just production philosophy. You go to the store, and how many different, when I was a kid, again, growing up, you went to the store, and there was basically one thing of eggs. Came in containers of a dozen, and for the most part, maybe there were two types of eggs. There were white eggs and brown eggs. Get that at the store. How many different types of eggs are there now when you go to the store? A lot. Too many. So you still have white eggs and brown eggs. You can get eggs, the container sizes vary from what? Six to more than 24. At Cash Saver and Guthrie, they now have five dozen eggs. They have they have these cases of crates of five dozen eggs that you can get. You can get cage-free eggs for those people who, and there are people who insist, and for those of you who, how many of you have had Dr. Worker egg? She raises her own chickens and has her own eggs. And I keep trying to get my family to let me have chickens, and they are just adamantly opposed to this idea of having chickens. I don't know why. But they, they do taste different. If you, if you eat eggs that are from chickens that are out in nature and scratching around, first of all, the shells on those eggs are much thicker. And why is that? Why are the, why are the shells on most of the birds that are farm-raised for egg production fairly thin? Not yours. They're not being fed. Yeah, they're not getting the same kinds of nutrients that they are. And so the shells, um, they have less calcium. And these eggs that you get from like Stacia are like they you actually have to crack them. And I've actually like dropped one on the floor and it not cracked. That's how oh, hard they are. Whereas the ones that you get that are caged chickens that are eating nothing but feed, they also have a slightly different taste. I think you can taste the difference because obviously what they eat goes into uh, maybe what the, the egg tastes like. And so we've got cage-free eggs for those people who want. And that's really just a marketing gimmick, isn't it? Because when they say cage-free, what do they really mean? Does it mean, I think people think that what it means for their own psychological satisfaction is that these animals are sort of free and in a state of nature, out there running on the prairies, <laughs> you know? pecking and, and having this glorious life. And is that what it means when they say they're kidding? It just means they're not in the cages. Of the yeah, it just means that they're not really kept in the cage their entire life. But the, the, the idea that, yeah, <laughs> the idea that there's some bucolic, idealized farm out there that's raising these cage-free eggs in massive amounts, where the chickens are free to roam and play <laughs> in their chicken-like games. It, it, it's just, that's not, that's not the way it is. But it, it makes us feel somewhat better about the whole thing if we think that they're not you know, kept in a cage where they're confined 24 hours a day for the sole purpose of, of laying eggs. And so you have these cage-free eggs. What else do you have? Well, you can get eggs that are already pre-beat, the egg beaters eggs so that you don't have to crack the shell and stuff yourself. You can get ones that are separated so that you just get the egg whites for those people who don't want all the cholesterol that comes with the egg yolks. And so these, even this most basic of products is now differentiated among various different types of eggs. So the production philosophy um, doesn't last beyond when we can start producing more and more stuff. Although you still see evidence of it, the two companies that I use are Apple under Steve Jobs, was very much a production philosophy company. It was, I'm going to build a product and you're going to buy it. You, you don't know what you want. I'm not going to engage in marketing research because I'm Steve Jobs and I know what's cool and I'm going to tell you what's cool. And he did. Now since he's died, has Apple become a more market-driven company? Yes, they have. What evidence do we have that they've become more market-driven? What kinds of things have happened since Steve went to be with Jesus? 
Huh? Yeah, he said there would never, it said there would never be an I, there would, you had to, in order to enjoy this product, you had to have a certain surface space of screen. And he was never going to have an iPad mini. What have they come out with? iPad demos? Why do they have the iPad minis? Why have they decided that they're going to engage in a marketing philosophy and actually listening to their customer? Well, because there's huge demand. Why do people want the iPad mini as opposed to the iPad? It's easier to carry around. Particularly if you've you know, got a limited amount of space. Where are these devices particularly wonderful? Anybody have kids? Anybody have, nobody has kids yet? Wow, that's unusual. I usually have some students that have got kids. These devices are particularly wonderful if you have children and you're traveling. Because you can keep the kid entertained for hours on a plane or in a car with an iPad. But if you're on a plane, why is an iPad mini me better than the iPad? Yeah, you've only got so much space. And for those carry-ons that you are getting smaller and smaller and more limited on, uh, on a daily basis, every sort of ounce counts, doesn't it? When you're traveling. How many of you have been on a plane recently? Was it a pleasant experience? They had a special on the other day, and they were talking about in one of the news stations, and they gave, they had this reunion of Pan Am stewardesses. And flying used to be much different than it is today. People actually dressed up to go get on a plane. They wore suits. I remember the first flight I took. We wore, my brother and I were dressed in little blue blazers because it was an experience, and not everybody did it. Now, the airport has become what the bus terminal was you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Would anybody even imagine getting on a bus in this day and age? They shut the bus terminal in Oklahoma City recently. It was a horrific experience to go down there. Rather, rather frightening. You were taking your life in your own hands. <laughs> and the airports have rather become sort of like that now in the modern era. So every sort of ounce and space matters when you've got you know, this much room between your legs and the seat in front of you, and you've got this much room, and you've only got so much that you can shove on to that carry-on, and so the iPad Mini comes along. But under Jobs, it was very much production philosophy. I think, I think Windows um, and Microsoft still operate with this production philosophy. They just pump stuff out there, and they don't really care. They've pumped out 10. Uh, is there any reason why? I mean, have they done much more? I, I don't know. Based on users, they pumped out Vista. Boy, that was a real nightmare. And, you know, but they're good at fixing it on the back end. After the production philosophy, so this goes from, you know, most of history from the beginning until about 1920. It's exemplified by the Ford Model T. You know, we're going to mass produce this stuff for a homogenous society that will buy it. After the 1920s, we get more competition in the market, and we get the sales philosophy. Okay, so from about 1920 till about 1960, 1955, 1960, somewhere in there, depending on which scholar you listen to, we get the sales era and the sales philosophy. What's the sales philosophy? Well, we now have not just the Ford Model T in the market. We have the Dodge Brothers that have entered the market. We have other companies that are building cars, some of which have gone the way of the Dodo. Things like Studebaker, or some of the others that have gone out of business over the years. Saturn. Saturn. Saturn all the, you know, we've got all these different companies. So now it's about selling. <laughs> Daimler merged with Mercedes and the came Daimler Benz and then Chrysler was uh, bought by them and they became Daimler Chrysler and they've now since sold Chrysler off. So they've sold it, I think, who's Chrysler been sold to? I'm trying to remember the most recent sale. Euro Motors, I think. No, Chrysler's been sold to, I think, of, I think it's an Indian company that actually owns Chrysler now. So it's not even American-owned anymore. It wasn't American-owned when the Germans bought it, when Mercedes bought it, which I never understood why. That seemed to me to be a bad 
combination, you know, Mercedes Benz and Chrysler. That I didn't understand why they they did that. Just like I didn't really understand why Ford bought Jaguar, and Ford has now divested itself of Jaguar. But we get more competition, so the idea is about selling and differentiating your product, making a pitch, getting interest, awareness, interest, desire, and then marketing action. And most of the bad ideas that we have about salespeople come from this era. When we, when we talk about a career in sales, it's amazing to me how many of my students say, well, I want to go into business, but I don't want to go into sales. And why do you think that is, that they don't want to go into sales? Maybe it might be too hard. Maybe it might be too hard. Salespeople have a bad image. Why do salespeople have this bad image? Being pushy. Being pushy. You think of car sales. Yeah, I think people think of the, the experience that they have with what they think about in, in terms of sales is this experience that they have in some of these in these environments, particularly in car sales. The other one that I can think of in Oklahoma is everybody has probably had some horrific experience at Mathis Brothers. <laughs> right? How many of you have had a absolutely god-awful experience at Mathis? If you haven't, you haven't lived in Oklahoma very long. They hire way too many salespeople for swarm you. The, huh? They just swarm you. They yeah, the minute you walk in, in, it's like <laughs> vultures picking over carrion. And it's annoying. And they don't listen to anything that you say. It's about making a pitch and getting the sale because they go through there. And so I think a lot of the attitudes that we have about salespeople originate from this era where it was about transactional selling. Making your pitch, getting the sale, and moving on to the next one. Moving on to the next sale. Of course, we see evidence of this philosophy continuing. Where do you see the sales philosophy in full swing and full force for those of you who have had me? Where do you see the sales philosophy being implemented? Real well, how about what? Real estate. I don't think you see it with real estate. Most real estate brokers now recognize that they probably have a customer lifetime value. But most people will buy more than one house. It didn't used to be so. So maybe you could sell one house. I don't think you see it in real estate. What about Billy Mays? How many of you remember Billy Mays? Billy marketed everything. What was Billy's most successful marketed product, probably? Oxyclean. I think OxyClean is probably the most successful product. Sham -wow. But Billy had lots of products. The ShamWow. <laughs> was OxyClean as wonderful as Billy said it was? No. Is it a good product? How many of you use OxyClean? A couple of you? I think it was a decent product, but I don't think it was as completely wonderful. Billy would show some kid sliding into home base and the mud and dirt on the uniform and say, just mix up a little bit of OxyClean and he had this bottle that you know, shake it up and pour it and oh, the stain would just evaporate away. <laughs> he marketed a product called Orange Glow. I tried this because I had wood floors throughout my house. And you know, just spray some Orange Glow on the floor, hard, Orange Glow hardwood. There were two versions. The earliest version was for your furniture, your, your tables and stuff like that to polish, get rid of the old English and use orange glow. It had a much better scent and everything according to Billy. And then he got this orange glow hardwood and he marketed it as, it will restore your floors and there's a commercial where he's got a sander out on these hardwood floors and he's, look at this, I'm doing damage to the floor. And then he sprays a little bit of this stuff on and viola, viola, it is, you know, restored and wonderful. And I have a house full of hardwood floors. And so I tried this product because I thought, God, you know, I don't want to have to refinish these floors every couple of years. If you have hardwood floors, it seems like, particularly in older houses, every five to ten years you're having to put on a new coat of polyurethane and stuff gets moved around and scratched. And I thought, well, that's just great. I'll buy. And it, it wasn't. It wasn't as great as, it, as Billy said it was. But 
I didn't send it back because what? It was too much trouble. It wasn't worth the hassle in terms of sending it back to say this is really not a great product. It's just sort of a mediocre, you know, kind of crappy cleaning product that doesn't work as well as you said it would. Billy also promoted the Hercules hooks. Those actually did work. Anybody remember the Hercules hook? That actually did work, and it was pretty, pretty good. It was a pretty decent product, I thought. Uh, OxyClean was probably the most successful, though. And then Billy, of course, flew to be with Jesus. And <laughs> somebody else took over, the skinny kid that did the sham wow after you know, Billy left it. So we still see that. The fair, I talk a lot about the fair. I love the Great State Fair of Oklahoma. It's one of my favorite events all year. And you see the sales philosophy there, right? It's about making a picture. You've got these guys with these speakers and these headsets on that are trying to sell you everything from the latest pots and pans to the newest and greatest, what, whatever it is, you know, bed cover, mattress, sheets, all of that. And it's about what's going to happen in two weeks when the fair is over. Well, they're going to pack up and move to the next one, the next fair. And so you still see the sales philosophy. I'm out of time, so we'll stop there. Um, we'll talk about the marketing philosophy. I did pass the roll sheet, right? Yes.